and take it away, Tim. Thanks a lot. So this is Fantastic Beasts and How to Taxonomize Them, a wizarding guide to the Drupal taxonomy system. I am Timothy Yoder. I'm a senior developer at ATLA, Collectors and Connectors in Religion and Theology. And I'm a lead developer on the internal Drupal system that powers ATLA's library metadata assembly and distribution for the religion database project product. Um, and so this is a site building course and it's a, it's a fairly basic one. It's intended to help introduce newer site builders to how the taxonomy system works. With Drupal in general and the taxonomy system specifically, Drupal often has an issue with making its various functions so generic, it's difficult to figure out what they are and how you can best use them. We may feel like we have a good grasp on what categories and tags are, but not what taxonomy is. And categories and tags are good taxonomies if, that's, if what you're managing is a blog. But if your site is doing something different than blogging, they're not, only, not the only metadata you would need to manage. And, Drupal takes a step back with taxonomies and tries to make a more generic user configurable system that can be applied to any case you throw at it, which is a process we refer to as abstraction. It makes the taxonomy system both much more powerful and a little harder to conceptualize, and that's why we're going to dive into it now. One's out. So, the Department for the Regulation and Control of Magical Creatures advisory website is in an awful shape. Everything is a jumbled mess on one page. Okay, so here's our, our fake site that we've put together. And it's got a whole bunch of different creatures uh, listed here. But you can see that it's just a standard bulleted list that's divided up. And Lord knows what organization is there. It's all jumbled together. It's not even alphabetized. But moreover, there's a lot of information that's very useful, a lot of depth, very useful, but it's just a link away, but what link are you supposed to click on? Which link is gonna be the helpful one? And so what I wanna point out here is that the layout itself is information poor. It doesn't give you a lot of guidance. It's just take it or leave it. Now, you know, this is an intentionally bad example, but I don't think any of us have to think too hard to think of a site that has a lot of content, a lot of dynamic content, but it's just hard to navigate. And that's what we're talking about. This isn't helpful. So right now, if you put yourself in the user's shoes, what can you not do with this layout? One thing you can't do is find a list of all the creatures that are dangerous. The other thing, if you want a pet, you cannot find a creature that can be safely domesticated. And if you saw something interesting in the bog, you can't narrow the creature down by its habitat. So big picture, what's wrong here? This does not encourage user interaction and exploration. Users might not spend long on the site, in other words. Finding what a user is looking for is burdensome. It, it puts a burden on the user. And you know, for a user who has a bad experience, they might leave and not return. And then last, this is bad for SEO. If the page crawler can't make connections, the site's not going to rank well. So this is one of the first principles that we want to think about. Organization itself is information. Okay. We'll just let that stand for a little bit. Organization is a way to present information, but itself it's information as well. And it makes an information rich site much more valuable. But first, what are taxonomies? So, I'm making reference to, there's a great document there that's linked here and it's linked at the end. I, I don't have it in, in chat right now, but uh, it is in the slide deck and I would recommend anyone who is interested in this topic, go, go ahead and grab the slide deck. It's, it's uploaded to the, the um, node on the MidCamp website. Uh, they define taxonomy as the practice and science of classifying things, and in Drupal specifically, the taxonomy module allows you to classify your website content, and it can be an important part of your information architecture. Taxonomy to us means assigning categories, tags, and other labels to our content in order to create meaningful relationships. In Drupal, your taxonomies are not predefined. You can make them into whatever you want them to be. And so when we're talking about how to make a, a taxonomy 
the three things we want to talk about are vocabularies, terms, and then the relationship between the content and the term. Okay. Vocabularies are the collections we're going to make, the buckets. They can be flat or hierarchical. That means that they can have relationships between each other or they can all be independent. Okay. Then terms are individual segments belonging to a vocabulary. They can be related to one another with parent-child relationships if it's a hierarchical uh, taxonomy, or they can be completely independent as we mentioned. So, you know, that means that a vocabulary is kind of like a class and then a term is an instance of that class. Okay, and then one more level down, we have relationships with the content. They say that the content is an instance of a term or belongs to the term or has the term as an attribute. And they may, we may be limited to one term per content item or not, you know, one content term, content item might have multiple terms, depending on what makes sense for the vocabulary. And so to be more concrete, we're going to go through some examples. So the first example is a flat vocabulary with only one relationship uh, between the content and the term. We're going to look at the Ministry of Magic Classification. This is, this is our first vocabulary, our first taxonomy that we're adding. Okay, every creature listed, specifically beasts, because you, this is insulting to give to a being. Uh, every creature, every beast that's listed is going to have one of these five rankings. It's either going to be one X for boring, two X for harmless, three if a competent wizard should be able to cope with it, four if it's dangerous or requires specialist knowledge, and five if it's a known wizard killer that's impossible to train or domesticate, and you're not asking Hagrid's opinion. So these are, you know, the features are that these categories are all independent from one another, meaning there, there isn't a relationship between them. One isn't nested beneath the other. And in this case, it doesn't make sense for a content item, a creature in this case, to have more than one classification. Uh, one, something can't be both boring and a known wizard killer, for example. So we look at the flobber worm. It's a boring creature. Uh, its Ministry of Magic classification is 1x, boring, but the relationship with the content is the flobber worm is rated as 1x, boring. Here's another example. This is a flat vocabulary, but more than one relationship is possible. So we've created a vocabulary for the Department of Regulation, for the Regulation and Control of Magical Creatures type. So there's the beast, being, and spirit divisions. And I added non-being, non which I'm sure for some fan purists is going to be controversial, but it's going to illustrate an important uh, distinction I want to make later on. So bear with me if that bothers you. Uh, the features. These categories are independent from one another, meaning that one's not nested below the other. Uh, but there are some circumstances where the classification of a beast can be genuinely ambiguous. Take, for example, the werewolf. Uh, the vocabulary, again, is the Department for the Regulation and Control of Magical Creatures type. The terms we're going to use, though, are both beast and being. The relationship with the content, the werewolf is classified as both a beast and a being, depending on its state of transformation. It's a beast in wolf shape, but a being when it's a human. Okay. And now let's look at an, a hierarchical taxonomy. Now, we're going to create a a habitat as an example of this because we're, we're used to how habitats can be subdivided. For example, forests can break down into temperate or rainforest types of forests. Aquatic can be freshwater or ocean. And obviously we can keep going with that. You know, uh, a freshwater could be subdivided into lake or river. Uh, temperate forest could be coniferous or deciduous or however you want to put it. Uh, but obviously they're more complicated, okay? These are categories that are related hierarchically to each other. Hierarchically means, you know, that there's, that there's an order. One way you can think about it is, you know, looking at the branching tree we have on the side, oftentimes the relationships will form kind of a tree structure that moves backwards to a single or a smaller list of categories. So, the features, these categories are related hierarchically to each other, and the forest is the parent of the rainforest, and the rainforest is the child of the forest. But if you keep making connections like that, you get your, your tree-shaped hierarchy. Okay, and like we said, you can keep breaking these distinctions down as you like, 
but you should be careful not to overcomplicate things. Um, some cautious re cautions for using a ta hierarchical taxonomy. Uh, and if you read the, the, the Drupal 7 guide that I have linked, and yes, I know it's Drupal 7, but it's very good general advice for Drupal 8 and 9. So hopefully we see, you know, updates of that document. I think it's very much worth looking over. Uh, that document's going to tell you, and I, I'll tell you here too, nesting things too deeply adds unnecessary complexity. Uh, for your own future sanity, you should try to select parent categories as well as child categories when you create the content relationships. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But, you know, basically, we'll talk specifically about creating the relationship between the contents and the term. Uh, what I'm saying here, though, is that if you were to use rainforest, the rainforest biome as a habitat, it'd be a good idea to put a check in forest as well so that if you ever need to create visualizations of everything that's forest, you wouldn't lose the things that are in a subtype. And if you created everything that was in a rainforest, it would also be inclusive upward, so on and so forth. Uh, obviously, there are ways to infer that relationship. You know, this is a relational database underneath, but honestly, keeping your data groomed ahead of time when it's possible is just going to make things a lot easier for you and keep your, your querying a lot simpler. So we're looking at the hippocampus. This is a sea monster. It's part horse, part fish. Uh, it would be an ocean aquatic habitat. The relationship with the, co the content, the hippocampus is an aquatic, is aquatic and lives in the ocean. I would ideally want to check both of those check boxes and say, both aquatic and ocean, so that I can list all of the aquatic together as well as all the specifically ocean creatures. So with that said, let's just take a quick breeze through how to set up our taxonomies. And this, this is one of those drink through the fire hose sorts of things. I got a lot of screenshots, but that's why the slide deck is there to look at later. Uh, we're, we're just gonna talk about how, how to actually make these work in a site. So we're going to go back to the DRCMC advisory website. We're going to add a new vocabulary. We're going to call that creature capabilities. These are the things that the creature is capable of doing. So I want to draw your attention to, first, we've got a human readable name that's required. There's also a machine readable name, creature underscore capabilities. Now, that standard worm case, meaning all lowercase, and the spaces are replaced with underscores that's gonna be forcibly unique in the system. And it's important because it might show up in things like URLs in the future. So you wanna make sure that even though it's, it's unique, you, you want it to be pretty human readable, even if we call it machine readable. Then we're gonna give it a description, the things the creature is capable of doing. All right, and now here it is. So in our list, you can see we've got a couple of other things in place, such as the subtype, the habitat, the Ministry of Magic classification, but second from the top is our creature capabilities. And if you look all the way on the right, there is a button that allows us to go to list terms. And under that, we're going to add our first term. So under name, we're going to call it flight. That's the ability to fly, and we'll save it. And then we'll go ahead and we'll add a couple of other things. Can it see in the dark? Is it capable of speech? Can it breathe underwater? Can it use fire? Is it venomous? Okay. So all those are terms that represent the creature capabilities. Um, and now the next thing we need to do is add this creature to our content type. And I want to say I, I've made a little bit of a leap here. Uh, previously, we were looking at the uh, we were previously looking at the taxonomy. So when when you're in the administrative mode, in standard Drupal eight uh, menu bar, administrative menu uh, under structure, we were in the vocab the taxonomy section. We've now switched to content types, and we're editing our creature content type, and we have created fields for all of these, everything that exists so far. You'll notice the field type is entity reference. If you're coming from Drupal 7, 
uh, taxonomy terms used to be their own type of reference, but now they're kind of grouped together. Entity reference, uh, entity reference in Drupal 7 could always reference taxonomies, but uh, in, in, the, in, in the interest of simplification, everything's an entity reference now. Um, so we're gonna add another field and it's gonna ask us what type we want. And you'll notice that it's grouped together, general, number, reference, text. Under reference, so that's an entity reference, we're gonna select taxonomy term, which is going to confine our scope of what we can reference to terms. We're not looking for files or users or content. And once again, we're going to give it a, a label. It automatically creates a machine name. Uh, in order to keep things simple, we're, we're naming it the same thing as we're naming the vocabulary and we hit save and continue. And, you know, here we get to second guess ourselves if we decide, oh wait, I didn't actually want this to reference taxonomy terms, we, we could fill something different out. But that's gonna be pre-populated. Uh, now, once again, we're talking about creature capabilities and a creature can have a bunch of different capabilities. So we're not going to limit the number of values, the number of relationships we can have. So we'll save the field settings. All right, and now we're on, we have one more screen, and this is a very important screen that's easy to overlook. Uh, under reference type, the most important thing is the vocabulary. So we may have named the vocabulary and the field the same thing, but it needs to know which vocabulary we're dealing with. Otherwise, it would just allow you to choose from any term or multiple, multiple vocabularies. So we're going to make sure that creature capabilities is selected. The next thing too is I'm gonna draw your attention down at the bottom under default value. You can see that the widget type that we have is a set of autocompletes. And you know, you got a bunch of different ways to make this relationship. If you got a large number of things in your taxonomy, which I would recommend avoiding for the most part for most situations, uh, you'll want the autocomplete because it will be a faster way to get through things. But in our case, we're gonna stick mostly with checkboxes. Uh, so on the next screen, you'll notice that we've, we've just saved our new field. Now we're gonna go one tab over from managing fields to managing the form display. And down at the bottom, as you can see, we're, we've defaulted to autocomplete. We're gonna change that to checkboxes slash radio buttons. And you know, just a quick tip, this is one of those pieces of visual vocabulary that we often forget we know about, but almost everyone knows that if you see checkboxes, you can select multiple values. If you see radio buttons, it's only one value. And effectively, those two are almost always mutually exclusive. So Drupal intelligently knows if our cardinality, you know, if the number of things that we, uh, number of values we allowed, is not limited or it's limited to more than one thing will be presented with checkboxes. If it was something exclusive like the danger system, X through 1X through 5X, we'd get radio buttons and it would be the same selection. All right. So now let's move over to edit the dragon. Uh, you can see a bunch of things that are already selected here. The Ministry of Magic classification is already at 5x. This is a beast. Uh, we gave it a guess at its habitat. And under creature capabilities, we're going to tell it that it can use fire and it can fly. Both of those are valid. All right. So that's a lot. We've got all our content entered, but we need to go and fill out the relationship for every other beast that's in the system. We got a lot more creatures to sort. So when I call your name, you will put on the hat and sit on the stool to be sorted. Now that the taxonomies are in place, what can we do with them? Well, let's redo that homepage to group the creatures by type. Okay. And make it so that when you click a subtype heading, we go to a more informative page. So this is as if we click through on the being type and we can see that we have centaur and goblin and ogre and all of these other beings listed. They have the, their title, they have 
a thumbnail of their picture and then they have an excerpt from their description and that's a lot more informative than what we've had before and we've only drilled in one layer now we could if we wanted to create a page where where this view is presented for everything but that's something we'll we'll try to talk about a little bit further on okay the next page is creature capabilities we now have a heading for every one of the capabilities that we just created. Flight, sight in the dark, speech, underwater breathing, uses fire, venomous. All of those creatures are relisted under those capabilities. And you'll notice amongst other things, our friend the dragon is now listed twice. It's listed four down under flight and under uses fire, it's third from the top. And it's helpful because if you want a list of capabilities, uh, you want it to appear twice. All right, and then last for this presentation, here's our Ministry of Magic classification. It sorts all of the all the beasties out by how dangerous they are. And you'll notice that this is a smaller list. Uh, the reason this is a smaller list is because the classification only applies to beasts. It doesn't apply to the others. And so if it doesn't have that relationship, if it's not rated, it's just not showing up on this view. All right, but now I, I'm sure by now some people are thinking, "How did we get here? We're looking at we're looking at web pages, but all we did was create the taxonomic structure." And yeah, there are some there was some steps that we need to go over to show how how we made that happen. So that is the second secret part of this presentation views integration. So we talked about taxonomy. Now let's just talk about how, how to use views with relationship to the taxonomy. All right. To make the most of our new taxonomies, we need to use views. Let's go over how you create the creature type view. Okay. So once again, we're looking at an administrative dashboard. We've clicked on structure. Views are down here at the bottom. We're going to tell it to add a view. And we filled out some basic information. We're looking at the DRCMC uh, subtype or type is what we called the view. Our view settings, we're showing contents of the creature type and we're sorting it by the title. And then we're going to create a page for it. Now, you could also do a lot of other things with views that are beyond the scope of the presentation, but suffice it to say, if you wanted to have a random creature of the week show up, or if you wanted to have, um, if, if you wanted to have interesting advisory subparts show up in a sidebar, that's what block settings would be for. They work almost identically with page settings and a view can actually serve both of them. That's why we have both checkboxes. We're gonna stick with pages just to keep the, the scope of the presentation confined. So we're gonna create a page. And we're going to select, uh, ideally we'd wanna select HTML list and a list of titles, uh, items to display, that's going to be a limiter that's going to make sure that only so much show up. If you don't want to use that, your choices are to set it at a very high number here or on the next page, you can just remove the limiter altogether. All right. So what we have so far is we have a list of creatures, but we have no sorting that we've defined ourselves. There's a default sort, but it's just, it's just a bare list of creatures. It has no relationship with the taxonomic terms that we're trying to bring in. And so the first thing you do, need to do is expand the advanced section in the right-hand corner and click add a relationship. All right. And under that, you know, I want to point out once we're in most of the interfaces in the views, there are two filters at top. There are very, very long lists of things that you can add as relationships and fields. You can type into the search box or use the category dropdown to narrow down what it shows you. It can be very helpful. You'll notice that I use that in later slides. So we're creating a creature subtype view. We want to create a relationship with the creature subtype. And you'll notice that what we're, the relationship we're using is 
under category, it says content. We're building a relationship based on the field that is in our content. So that field is referencing a taxonomy. We are using the link in that field. All right. And then because we, we only want to show things that actually have a subtype, we're going to check the next checkbox that says require the relationship. It means that if the creature doesn't have a subtype assigned, we're just not going to show it. And I want to say for anyone who thinks in SQL already, you don't have to know SQL to work with views. The, the main design is that that wouldn't be required. But if it's already something you have available, I'm going to just kind of give a couple of tips on that. This is the equivalent of using an inner join rather than a left join. Okay. So below our configuration interface, we have this preview pane and you can see that at this point, we don't have much. We just have a list of creature names that don't even link to anything yet. So up under display, we're going to tell it, we're gonna click on the fields link and title, we're going to check the checkbox that says link to the content. And that means that all of those titles are now going to link to the content page. It's much more useful. And then we're, gonna, we're not gonna stop there. We're going to click to add another field. And this is where we really start bringing our taxonomy in. So I, I typed name up in the search box and the category column is really helpful here to see what you're dealing with. When I say name, you can see that the category is a taxonomy term. Okay, so I'm gonna click that and I'm gonna add the field, um, click the checkbox and click add, add and configure fields. So I wanna back things up just a little bit. When we're talking about a taxonomic term, there are two pieces of information that are really, really important about a taxonomy term. Okay, one of them is the name, the human readable part. So flight that we've already dealt with is really, is gonna be what you are tempted to think of as being the taxonomy term. But if you look up in the URL, uh, it says taxonomy term 23 edit. Okay, that 23 is a very important number. That is what we call the term ID or TID. And it's analogous with the node ID everywhere else for our content. Okay, and it is going to be the canonical version. One thing is, if you think about it, under different vocabularies, you could feasibly have different taxonomy terms that have the exact same name. Uh, and that would be confusing if you saw them all together and not separated by the taxonomy term. It can be a problem if you're trying to address the nodes programmatically and you only have their names. So in the database, the term ID is really important and it shows up in some other places we'll discuss at least in the appendix of the slide, uh, slide deck. Okay, so the big thing though is a term is an entity just like a node or like a user and just like nodes have node IDs and users have user IDs, taxonomy terms also have unique IDs. All right, so going back, uh, I'm just gonna go back here. Yeah, we've added the taxonomy term name and we're going to add a, rela the relationship is there, it's provided by the field when we created the relationship earlier. And you know, because, because this bridge is necessary, you need that field to make a bridge between the content and the taxonomy term. This relationship is already filled out, but there are other times when you're making more compl complicated views where you might have multiple taxonomy terms linked for the sake of the view. And this is where you would need to tell it which one you're trying to reference. When you just say, I wanna, I wanna show the taxonomy name, it's like, great, which name are you talking about? this is the one where we specify which field to get the taxonomy name from. Okay, uh, now here's, here's a place where this can be a little, a little confusing when you're coming at this fresh. I've checked exclude from display. We don't wanna say the creature's ability next to the creature's name every single time. We want to group it by that ability. And so we don't wanna show it right now. Uh, but we are going to tell it to link to the taxonomy term so that when it does show up, you can link through to the taxonomy page. 
Okay, and so back under our base uh, view settings, we're going to go to format, and we're gonna click the settings here under the main format. And this is where we have the option to start grouping things. And so we could group it by content title. That's not likely to gonna be useful very often. Uh, you'd have to be doing something very specific for content title to be a good grouping. But uh, we're going to group it on the taxonomy term name that we just added in. And the last thing we wanna take a look at for the structure is we wanna make sure that these things come in in a sane order. We, you know, previously they've been jumbled up. The default sort criteria assumes that this is something like, uh, something like a blog where you wanna show the most recent, uh, the most recent content first. And that's not really what we're aiming for in the, in, when it's more static content. Static meaning we're putting this in once and for all. This is part of the structure of the site now, not just like, not just metadata on posts. So we're gonna go ahead and remove the sort criteria that exists there and then add our own. The first thing we're gonna look for is that ta taxonomy name. And this is gonna mean that once we see the groupings of the creature types, they're gonna be in alphabetical order. So we look for name, we grab the taxonomy term, and then we're going to also add the title so that underneath those headings, the creature names are going to be alphabetical as well. We'll add and apply that. And now let's look at our, our uh, preview. And this looks a lot better. We have beasts, beings, non-beings, and spirits. That's all in alphabetical order. And under each of these, they're in alphabetical order. The other thing I wanna show you, and this is a, a setting that's easy to Google. I didn't throw it into the slide to complicate things. You can tell views to show you what the underlying SQL query is. So if SQL is a tool in your toolbox already, uh, and views is not behaving the way you expect it to be, this is a very common thing. Views is definitely a learning curve part of Drupal. Uh, sometimes having the SQL query there to tell it, show me your steps, show me how you got where you are, is a good way to to get it to tell, get Drupal and get views to tell you what you're thinking. And I would say if SQL is not in your toolbox, it can be a good way to ask for help. So trying to get, trying to get uh, views help on say Stack Overflow, it can be more difficult uh, and you, you'd have a smaller group of people being able to help or being able to understand what you're describing if you're just showing them screenshots of views, but sometimes that query can be helpful in getting help as well. Um, and then because we're creating a page, I want to go ahead and just add a header here. We're going to add a text area and we're just going to put down some convenient explanatory text for what this page is about. All right. And with that, we've created our view and our view also has a page that it lives on in the Drupal routing system. So if we go into the site's configuration, go to the basic site settings and give it are the URL of that new shiny view that we just created and save it. This is now our new homepage and it's done. All right. Is that really everything? Yeah, obviously there are a couple of other things that we touched. Uh, there's an appendix to the slide deck. I wanna leave room for questions. I don't wanna, I, I don't wanna run us out of time. So I'm going to go ahead and leave this as, something we'll go over in the presentation if there's time and interest. But otherwise, there's, there's a little bit more step-by-step -step information at the end. Uh, so we're just gonna go ahead and keep things moving for now. But I wanna talk about some quick taxonomy design principles. And in some ways, I think this might be the most useful part of the topic. And I think the thing we might most come back to in the question and answer I got four comments for you. Okay, comment number one. Taxonomies blur the line between content and configuration, but they are content, not configuration. Uh, leading in with a heavy one here. This one is a complicated thing to understand, but you know, sometimes you're developing a site and you're using tools other than just ad hocing the configuration and then copying the database into production. Like, 
no slight on that at all. That is a that is a great way to do a simple site that is often the best way to communicate with the clients. But there are times when uh, you got a more complicated workflow. You're working with a team and you need to have everything in source control. And that means you're using deployment tools uh, like configuration manager. Okay. And sometimes this gets really blurry where you've got a taxonomy that actually builds out the structure of your site and builds out uh, how you, how your pages link together. Well, that, that you're going to have to have another solution for that. Okay. Uh, sometimes you got to do things uh, to fill in the gaps. You know, if you're using configuration manager features, things I've used before include install hooks and custom modules that, uh, <clears throat> you know, allow you to set up the vocabulary and pre-populate the terms. You know, another thing that can be helpful is capturing the terms as, you know, uh, variables in the system uh, under a, a unique and repeatable name so that you can do all your program. If you have to address them programmatically, you can go against a variable name instead of hoping that your system and the staging server and your friend's uh, system all use the same term IDs, okay? But if it's got, a, if it's got an ID on it, it's content more than, more than structure and more than configuration. Okay, the next thing is it means that taxonomy terms are not static. They're gonna need care careful planning and maintenance in order to keep them in line. It's a garden that needs to be weeded, it's a, it needs to be tended, and oftentimes when you got more, more stakeholders in there, you gotta be careful to make sure that people don't add things that don't belong there or take away something that someone was relying on. And I mean, there's a certain philosophy about this too. Uh, third bullet point, if you have separate teams developing the site and its contact, content, this is a really crucial point of collaboration. You need to make sure that the content developers understand the taxonomy system and they're on the same page, okay? Uh, you know, there, there are certain philosophies about what you want to include and what you want to exclude. And you want to make sure that you're not butting heads over that. And the, the content team that you're going to hand the site off to understands how to drive it. All right. Comment number two, as mentioned before, think twice before using hierarchical taxonomies and think har even harder about using more than one level of nesting. So if the views discussion was a lot to take in, getting views to work with hierarchical taxonomies is a lot more complicated, not terribly pleasant. Uh, ask yourself if the representation of the hierarchy actually makes things easier for the user or you just think it's necessary. If it makes things easier, you know, and, and it's really helpful to the user, and if you think it's worth it, go for it. It's there for a reason, just don't assume, okay? Comment number three. This is one of the biggest philosophical arguments you can have about taxonomy. Don't make your categorization too broad or too narrow. You gotta find the Goldilocks zone. The conflict between the universal and the particular goes back to Socrates. <laughs> and probably even further, we don't need to overcredit dead white men. Greek is white, I get, well, it's Western. Anyway, uh, cast your net too wide and you're gonna connect things that are too dissimilar to each other. And if you're too particular and meticulous in all your distinctions, you might miss meaningful connections. Uh, these are all about making connections. These are all about joining ideas together and grouping things that are, are helpful. Uh, just focus on what's helpful, okay? So some examples from this talk. Uh, we used uses fire instead of breathes fire. So in this example, I think that fire is what's important. Whatever a blast ended scroot does with fire, it isn't breathing it. So we broaden the feature to make it a little bit more useful. If you're, if you're wondering, do I need to wear fireproof clothing? You're not really asking which end of the creature does the fire come out of, all right? Spirit versus non-being. Yeah, this is one of those things that I think could be very controversial to fans and purists, but I thought it might be worth, worth mentioning here. This argument is exactly the sort of taxonomy argument you would have. Non-beings are things like dementors or boggarts that are amortal and they're born out of human emotions. And I think that that's enough to set them apart from things like ghosts that maybe 
we can give them their own their own bucket because there's something slightly different going on with them. Um, you know, they're not exactly a banshee. They're not exactly a ghost. We create another division to be more precise. Maybe this is a helpful division. Maybe it isn't. But uh, that's the sort of thing that I think might be an example of creating an ex extra category because that extra category makes a meaningful distinction. All right. Then my fourth comment is keep your users in mind and fight for simplicity. Okay. When there's a conflict between the provision that we, f the precision that we feel is necessary and the simplicity that will make the site easier to use for users, we need to let go. Uh, I mean, I could say I work with librarians and librarians are very precise. They're very passionate about their precision. And sometimes that causes, causes arguments. Okay. Sometimes we have to advocate for simplicity against clients and against stakeholders because it's what's best for the user. And the reason, the big picture for this is that a simple site breeds engagement. Now maybe, maybe there are ways to bring some of the extra precision in that are at a deeper level, you know, in the long tail of user engagement. Some people who are really, really hooked can find what they need, but we want to make the, the cost of entry, the cost of starting engaging with your site as low as possible. Okay. So the conclusion, thank you for joining me in this talk on the subtle science and exact art of taxonomies. Use them well and you will be able to bottle organization, brew user interaction, and even put a stopper in your page's bounce rate. Thank you. So, all right, I'm gonna unmute everybody and that's all I'll give. Tell me, a huge round of applause. It's in the fridge, my mom is just in the Ooh, yeah, yeah. All right, I'm gonna mute everybody again. <laughs> that would be a little chaotic. Uh, but yeah, um, if you can pull up the chat uh, under the uh, yeah. top menu, or you can see there's a lot of good comments in there. Um, a lot of it about Harry Potter. <laughs> um, great presentation. Um, if anybody would like to ask a question out loud, go ahead and use that raise your hand function. In the um, in the uh, participants menu. Um, let's see. Wouldn't it be a fair to suggest taxonomy as meta content more than just content? Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I I agree that it's meta content. It's 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 one of those harder to find distinctions. I mean, I I was wanting to focus on it mostly in terms of can you rely on this existing, if you're if you're using it uh, as part of your structure in site development, you know if you're if you're working with a configuration manager, you're working with features, and you're expecting your site to deploy out with it, uh, then you know you might have a, a bad realization when you when you find that you've blown away your database and tried to rebuild the site and all that content you're relying on is isn't there, so. I mean, it's it's a lot like like users aren't exactly content, but if you you know you can't you can't build out a site from lower principles without uh, and include users without doing something else to accommodate them. Um, but yeah, it's a fair distinction. All right, and I forgot to mention that is a question from Daniel um, Uh Let's see, there was one other one here. Um, uh, what, are, are you Slytherin? That was the first question. Griffin, Gryffindor Personal, Slytherin. Personally, I actually think of myself more as Ravenclaw, although I, I really like McGonagall a lot, so. <laughs> uh, that was and also, I also really like Alan Rickman. <laughs> <laughs> also from Daniel, um, let's see, uh, you mentioned the TID could vary between two working groups. Any tips on syncing this? Seems like a potential huge headache if they differ. Uh, I mean, I can only, this is one that I would, I would love to like point, open up to other people, especially people who have more uh, experience in Drupal 8 ex itself. I mean, I saw Beck White had a good comments on, you know, the UUID uh, having additional functions and for the simplicity, I didn't, I didn't go into that. 
but um, it, it's, it is an important distinction. The way we've worked in the past, uh, in, you know, I, I have to admit, I mostly work on a Drupal 7 site, is uh, to assign TIDs to a, a system variable and then always, always working, you know, if I've got to do any programmatic selection, I'm working off of the TID. Now, various views exports, that can get really, really difficult if you're telling a view to be contextually bound to a specific term ID. Uh, you might have to do some real magic footwork to, to get that to work in every build. Right on. Um, a lot of comments in there. I guess chats are good for those kind of comments. Yeah. Um, um, does anyone else have any other uh, questions at this point? Or anything you'd like a comment on? I guess that would be a question. <laughs> uh, feel free to raise your hand if you want to shout it out loud. Let's see what we got. Um, so you would be faced with matching new UIDs and repopulating TIDs in the database. Uh, I guess that's a question to Beck White. <laughs> Daniel. Yeah. Uh, oh no, she had the suggestion. You're right. She question. did. Yeah. She you, she suggested. Actually, actually, if you would uh, mind me on mute, you, Beck, uh, we can. Uh, you can. All right. Let me. Let's do some mute you. There. If, if you care to talk out loud for your mic. Yeah, goes. I mean, if the issue is like, um, like creating taxonomy terms during development and like having development content or something like that, um, I, you know, I don't think you could really solve it with uh, UUIDs. Um, I think that's more for just making sure content is aligned across different sources. Um, but it doesn't help at all with views or with entity references or anything like that. So. Cool. All right, thank you for that perspective. Thank you. All right, put you back on mute. Raise your hand if you want to come back off back. Happy to do that. Um, uh, so we got a question from Ralph. Um, mm -hmm. Rafe, uh, uh, what? What, uh, or Ralph, I guess it is. At what point uh, will get the number of terms and or the layers of hierarchy get in the way of site performance? So, I mean, I'm also very open to other people uh, talking to this. The, just assigning them isn't going to do anything harmful. You can, you can do an awful lot of creating the taxonomy is what comes, your, your real pinch points come when you try to visualize it. I, uh, you know, like, I, I always tend to go back to SQL language, so sorry if that's not helpful, but if you have to crawl your way down a taxonomy, a hierarchical taxonomy, that's the equivalent to adding a bunch of joins to your query, and it's also worth knowing that, you know, the, the query that, that you get in the diagnostic mode is not exactly the whole story. It's, it's definitely telling you what it's doing to visualize, but it's, there's even more overhead to what you're seeing. So if you're doing something that's going to require you to crawl down a bunch of different levels, uh, it, it's going to, that's where your performance hits are gonna start stacking up really fast, no matter how many things are in the actual view. Um, the the other thing though is like there there are ways to get around it if it works you can you can actually have people drill through so that you you say you know okay here's the list of top level terms i click on one of them and now i'm going to contextually filter on all of the next level terms that link that are children of what we just linked to and it's going to pull you know that top level term it's going to pull it out of the context uh you know Contextual terms, I'm sorry, they are in the appendix uh, to the, the slide deck, but we haven't gone over them. They're a very important concept, especially when it comes to making hierarchical views. So like an example of this would be, I, one site I worked on at one point had a sort of directory structure where it, it had a whole bunch of different categories that you would wanna drill through. 
Um, and, you know, for the sake of simplicity, I allowed that one to be nested three deep, maybe just two deep. Uh, no, three deep, but I didn't show any content on the first level. On the second level, I started showing content. Uh, but, you know, I might have had to gate that content on the second level. And on the third level, you're, you're doing much better. I hope that's helpful. Cool. Well, looks like the conversation is still going over in the chat. Good, good conversation. Um, there's a question in there, um, looks like. Uh, yes, thanks very much, Beck. Um, and I think that's the conversation between, uh, oh no, here we go, Tim. So beyond user simplicity, is it maybe better to view taxonomies as flatter list of images? Or I'm sorry, it's a flatter list of tags. That makes more sense. Yeah, I mean, I think depending on your taxonomy, there are times where the structure is valuable. Uh, lists of tags, I think, if you can get away with it, I think is often the easiest way to go about it. Um, but sometimes if you've got an awful lot of content that you're trying to curate, uh, it might be helpful to, to do a, a, a hierarchy where the first thing you're looking at is just uh, is just a list of top level categories and then you start breaking out the contents once you've selected that. Um, it really, it really comes down to what, what's your taxonomy doing? Hmm. All right. Any other thoughts or questions here at the end? Well, I want to say again, thank you very, very much uh, for giving this presentation. It was awesome. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now. So um, thanks again.